Okay, now we go. Yes. Now I'm, 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 I'm ready. Yes. Okay. All right. So, well, good morning, everyone uh, in Brazil and good afternoon. Now we go. Lutila I'm, I'm, I'm in Italy and uh, also Teresa, who's in Italy. It's a great pleasure to start. Uh, it's a great pleasure to start this, uh, this section with the session of our uh, Eng uh, English as a Lingua Franca meeting of our research group. And today we have a very special, one, one more very special uh, guest, uh, who's uh, our dear Lutila Lopriori, directly from Rome. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to read a little bit about Lutila's, so Lutila's bio data. And then as we follow the, the same uh, script, I'll give Lutila uh, 30 to 40 minutes for her to talk about the text and also uh, her research or, or her studies in elf, in, in, on ELF. And then after this, we will open for questions uh, in the group. And then we open for questions uh, on, on uh, for, for the questions coming from the YouTube channel. So then uh, good morning to the people here uh, in the room, to our uh, fellow researchers. And good, mor good morning for the, 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 the audience on YouTube. Thank you for coming and thank you for being with us. So then uh, let me talk a little bit about Lucilla. Lucilla is a great friend and a very admired uh, researcher. And she's an associate professor at Roma Tre University in Rome. She has an MA in TEFL from Reading University. She has a PhD in Italian as a foreign language from Siena University. She was a TESOL. She's very much involved in TESOL. Uh, she was TESOL Italy president from 1996 to 1998. So she's also, uh, she was also part of TESOL International Board of Directors from, uh, for three years. Uh, she was al she's also a TESOL uh, Research Professional Council Chair from 2013 until now. And uh, she is a qualified, uh, she was qualified as language teacher education uh, by British, the British Council uh, Fulbright, San Francisco State University. As a teacher educator, she has run numerous pre and in service courses for English language teachers, CLIO teachers abroad. She's also a course book writer uh, she has published extensively on early language learning uh, in uh, ELF, ESP, assessment, and teacher education in also world Englishes. So she uh, was a recipient of scholarships from the British Council for three times, from Fulbright Commission uh, for, uh, twice, and from the European Union. So she's a coordinator and member of the scientific committees of several European Center of Education for the European Union. Uh, and her main research interests are ELF, CLIL, teacher education, educational linguistics, early language learning and assessment. I could be here for hours talking about Lutila's experience yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and curriculum. So then, uh, but it, it's really, I really would like uh, uh, me and, and, and my fellow researchers, Lucila, we really would like to thank you for being so nice and for saying yes from the first, for the very first time I, I consulted with you. And uh, it's, it's really great having you with us. So Lucila was here in Salvador a couple of years ago and uh, she wants to come back and, and we really <laughs> comes back. Okay, so thank you, Lucila. So the floor is yours and we'll listen to you. So take your time and we are thank really looking forward to, to listening to you. Right. Welcome. Thank you. thank you very much for all this long and extensive introduction. There were some typos, that, but uh -huh. I will write to you later 
quote okay. is quite important and I would like to share with all of you because uh -huh. you will understand from my presentation that there is some, some quote, uh, something in my uh, background, in my professional life that has made it possible for me to come and share with you these ideas. For 25 years, I was a teacher at school. I taught from in primary, middle school, uh, vocational schools. So I had a wide range of experiences. Then my experience as a teacher educator, I started a long time ago. I think it was 1982 when I started. And every year I've been teaching national, international training courses. So this, I'm not saying this just <laughs> uh, to add the information, but that's why I think, uh, and I need to thank all of those who gave me the possibilities like scholarships, grants, to travel around, to be exposed to all of that. To my students, I started, I remember when I was uh, uh, 20, I had gone to England to learn some English. At that time you had, I traveled by train for 36 hours to reach London and uh, worked as an au pair girl there didn't have enough money to pay my courses. So I was just listening, right? And when I came back, it was Christmas. My sister told me, you know, there are two schools, uh, Catholic schools who are looking for someone to teach English to their primary school children. That was, I'll tell you, 1971. That was, I mean, private schools were launching early language learning. So I was exposed to that and circumstances made it possible for me later after something like almost 30 years to be involved in three national and international research on early language learning. And I kept thinking of those first days because everything is relevant or oh, as a famous American writer says, everything is illuminated by your experiences. Having said that, having said that, let's start with a lot, um, expressing all my gratitude uh, to Savio and his fantastic group, really fantastic, because it's a very united group, very well read, very well prepared, and uh, I was sort of a bit worried because they challenge you continuously. And I think this is in the nature of Brazilians, but also in the nature of the type of uh, um, experiences that they've been having with Savio in their university. And uh, so I said, oh, let's, uh, let's be careful here. They might give, ask you um, peculiar questions, but, uh, the environment and the, the atmosphere is very friendly. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for having shared with me uh, two fantastic days in Bahia. I think it was three years ago. I can't remember. It was after Ireland in Rio. Having said that, that was really uh, a great experience. Of course, I would like to go back, but I would like also to have some of you Brazilians from Bahia come to Rome. That would be very great. We have to organize something. Having said that, um, uh, I today I understood uh, that format is such that I present you with something, but also if you have read my abstract, I am offering you lots of questions to reflect upon together. This is a golden opportunity we have to share because one of the things that, again, my professional life gave me the opportunity to do was to uh, see similarities, lots of similarities, threads uh, across cultures, across countries, across continents. I remember attending my first teacher education course in England, 1988, and the following year going to 
San Francisco State, another culture, another environment, still, that was the time of research, action research and classroom-based research. And it was interesting to see that the threads were across the ocean or across the pond, as we say. So there is something universal that we teachers, particularly we teacher experience all the time, something that makes us say, oh, look, the same observations, the same um, uh, circumstances are true here in Rome, in my home country, and the same in Brazil or the same in the States. I was in, last November in Pakistan for a very enjoyable tour of Pakistan, gave lectures. To me, it was an incredible experience, almost as incredible as the one that I had several times going to New Delhi for Teachers of Italian. And uh, I, it was unavoidable. There are so many points in common. So I think we have to build up networks the famous communities of practices should be transnational, transcontinental. Having said that, this is why uh, I sort of prepared a set of questions that will come at the end of my first part presentation. And I sent you an article. I didn't know what to send you because when Savio asked me for an article, I said, oh, which one? And the first one that I found was this one. So uh -huh. this was published 2018, but it refers back to some experiences of teacher education that I had done uh, back in 14, 15, and 16. And uh, um, so uh, just to say, then I said, well, it's going, it might be interesting for them because as a matter of fact, I remember starting uh, studying ELF, being interested in ELF and immediately uh, using ELF within the teacher education courses a long time ago, a very long time ago. And I made a point that every time I was running a teacher education course, I was going to introduce that. I had the most different reactions, but I introduced that in courses for teachers of English at middle, high school, primary, but also to teachers of subject matters. Because in Italy, we have CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning, which was introduced almost uh, more than 10 years ago, but all in, during the 90s, it was diffused at exp an experimental stage. And uh, uh, since 2013, we had, well, content teachers who wanted to teach their subject matter in another European language. In the end, it was always English, but this was stated. So remember also in terms of language policies, what is being stated and what can be implemented, because that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And so in 2013, uh, the Ministry of Education introduced CLIL only in the last three years of high school, offering the opportunity to content teachers to uh, teach their subject matter in another European language. Uh, one of the four European languages officially studied at school. Obviously, let's say 98% used English, but this is unavoidable. Okay, let's not start the whole issue about English, but it's unavoidable. It will take some time to overcome that. And uh, I, uh, but in order to prepare these teachers for this task, uh, people like me were asked to run specific methodological courses. And what did I do? But introduce there also ELF, or the English. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I kept, and you will see it in, uh, in the article that I sent you. I spoke about this um, uh, word English and then in forms perspective, where I introduced several things. I'm going to show you something at the end of it, uh, but just to uh, start with something that I'm going to show you towards the end. And to show you that 
there are lots of initiatives, training initiatives, and some training initiatives as the ones that Teresa Muschera from my two year uh, ago course uh, spoke about because she attended that course. That was a course only on where the English is an elf. So only for that, only for English teachers. But as a matter of fact, and this is my main point, as I have been observing all these threads across oceans, across countries, I also think that one of the innovations that, that has come out very strongly together, parallel to the diffusion of ELF, is the fact that we are beyond the issue of English language teachers. Most of the issues that are raised, have been raised in the last 15, 20 years, particularly in terms of uh, obviously in the environment of English, uh, apply to all languages and not only to all, uh, all foreign languages, because in a way or another, there is this continuous cross-fertilization, because if I talk about language awareness, now we're going to look at definitions of English as a lingua franca awareness, but when we talk about language awareness, something that we had forgotten in the 70s back in England, language across the curriculum, mm -hmm. doesn't it come out? It emerged very clearly when I was teaching the clear teachers, subject matter teachers. So there are things that come back because they are still valid, something that we didn't pay enough attention to. And I think that health research is sort of pushing us to focus on these threads that we should mm -hmm. be paying attention to. So this is why I'm so happy to be speaking here now, because as a matter of fact, I've got a different audience, but I'm sure that I've got very careful ears. And because, as I put in the title, there is more than meets the eye, that we very often tend to forget because maybe we have too many things. We are struggling through too many things. So having said that, I will uh, present some issues. As I stated at the beginning, I'm going to sort of delve into some notions here and there, not all of them, because we are not here to teach you what ELF is or things like that. We, we go beyond definitions also because ELF is being seen in a multi-perspective now, right? And, uh, and then towards the end, I will also show you something coming from uh, the CLIL courses and uh, uh, I will then end by throwing at you something related to what I've been speaking, but asking you please to contribute with your own experiences. Right, so I think I can share the screen right now, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Uh, I hope I can manage with the pictures not covering. Okay. Right. I use this very sophisticated poster that you have produced. Uh, I, I tried to imitate it a bit, but it didn't work. So I just used the purple uh, as a, a sort of... Uh, uh, light motif for my presentation. Uh, I use more than meets the eye because I think that this is what we are all facing. Uh, the challenge of being focused maybe on too many things and the difficulty to really focus in the sense of looking carefully at uh, what is going on. And what is going on is not only in our classes, not only in our readings, not only in our exchanges, but it's in the society we live in. So uh, this is an invitation to focus more. And I was speaking to someone, to a colleague, Lucy Ellen, 
uh, earlier on saying that how much I have learned by teaching online, which is extremely stressful, but extremely fruitful because you start seeing things that you didn't look at. So we need always to be surprised, carrying with us all that our uh, personal beliefs uh, and experience. So the, um, the second part of the title is, what are the challenges and implications in implementing an alpha word perspective in the language classroom? Now you're all um, language teachers, language researchers, language teacher educator. You will notice that I'm not using in the English language classroom because I regard all classrooms, language classrooms. And let me tell you a very brief story. When they started in 2013, the uh, implementation of CLIL in, uh, <coughs> in, um, uh, in Italian schools, they started using a, an acronym that I couldn't understand at the beginning. In order to refer to the content teacher, content sub, subject content teachers, they use the, ex, the acronym DNL. In Italian it would be discipline non linguistiche. And I was furious because it was uh, uh, damaging all the points I wanted to make in the course because I don't think that a subject teacher is not a non linguistic teacher. The subject teacher is not aware of the value of language in teaching, but should be more and more involved in focusing on language. So when the Ministry of Education said that they are non-linguistic teacher disciplines, I, I get very annoyed, but it's said. Right, having said that, let's go to what I consider the emerging challenges for us. And when I say for us, I refer to language teachers, again, as I said before, not only English language teachers, language teachers in general, teacher educators, researchers, because let's not forget that if we are now discussing most of these issues is mainly because of um, the wide amount of research that has been carried out in uh, different contexts and in classrooms, particularly since ELF was the object of research. So let's think of researchers because there is a challenge also for researchers. Sometimes teachers and researchers and teacher educators coincide, but not all the time, which is a pity in a way. <laughs> And, but also for language policies, make, policies makers, why so? Let me tell you something. At the moment I was involved by uh, the Ministry of Education in, in Italy. I'm part of the scientific committee that is preparing the tests for future teachers who will compete next month to enter uh, as school teachers. And I'm very proud of uh, saying that they still saved part of the program that I contributed to uh, five years ago, where among the themes that future language teachers should be um, aware of and competent in, there is English as a lingua franca word Englishes. So uh, I'm very proud to, to see that a small result entered the policies, the language policies, and it was admitted. Now, which are all these challenges and where do they come from? Well, I think that all of us in different ways, because here I'm speaking mostly as an Italian and as a European, but also on the other side of the pond, we've got similar situations. The migration, the tidal migration flows that in the last 20 years, more 
um, more strongly in the last 10 years have crossed all of Europe, coming from uh, Southeast Asia, Asia, uh, um, uh, Central Asia, and from Africa. But not only from there, we've got migrant flows coming from South America. And this has totally changed the scenario. This is something that is challenging all of us, not only teachers, because it's something that is unstoppable and we have to face it in the right way. Let's put it this way. It's something, and forgive me for the um, comparison, it's something we have to come to terms with in the most positive way as we are come, trying to come to terms with the COVID, the virus. This is something that has taken us by surprise. We didn't expect, we didn't expect the reactions of some countries. We didn't expect to be so unprepared. That's why I say that there are some notions like language educations and uh, language education that is suddenly back. And it's something that we start, we should start thinking about. So the migration flows have been a challenge for us and have brought about translingual, transcultural orientations and repertoires. This is coming up very quickly, very fast. It's, um, in the last 10 years, there has been a lot being published, being introduced in courses on, for example, translingualism, translanguaging, and uh, the repertoires are there. And this is something that as teachers, because we are language teachers, we should not forget. I'm giving this example out of the Italian context where, where uh, most colleagues who were not at all aware, didn't expect this flow of migration up to 10 years ago, had to reshape all their teaching, revisit their teacher education and start looking at these new repertoires. This is a huge challenge. Also, this has brought about uh, um, several notions that have become part of most of our courses at university level in teacher education courses. Thanks to Zygmunt Boyman, we can talk now about a liquid society where everything fluxes around and where notions as super, super diversity, translanguaging, code meshing, are predominant and they are used to describe phenomena that are taking place all over the world. But what is interesting is that there is a continuous flux, a continuous uh, meshing of all these new diversities. And here I'm, I'm quoting Boyman, Blomart, Kanagarasha, Penny Cook, Vertovec, so the most relevant um, scholars in the field. Maybe not all university courses have offered a space for these notions, but they are fundamental for the preparation of teachers from primary to upper secondary. Another challenge is the challenge of what I call the multimedia literacies, but also illiteracies. Something which is a challenge because it is a challenge for someone who is maybe as old as I am and I'm not fully literate in multimedia and slows me down. But so I'm sort of half literate but we also face a transmigration flow where there are many people coming, particularly from Africa, who are 
semi-literate or totally illiterate. So when they arrive, the uh, institutions that take, uh, try to integrate them, it's not only a matter of teaching Italian as a second language, it's how you teach it because to people who are half literate. And how are you going to assess them to measure their competencies? And also what I called mutant learners. Our learners, these 2020, are not the same learners of 2010 because they, I call them as mutant. They are mutant because they are adjusting uh, to new technologies. They are much faster than their teachers. They, are, they follow different um, reasoning paths. And we have to know how to cope with that. I mentioned there something that has just come out, out of a project that was an Erasmus project that was carried out by a multi-European uh, group. Um, if you want, I can send you the link to that. Is uh, the Common European Framework of Reference has developed a framework on digital competencies that will help teachers to sort of reshape also their way of describing these new competencies of their learners. And we've got a new school population and new learners, first and second generation children of migrant families in European context. What is special about them? That these students very often are multilingual speakers because in their families, they have more than two mother tongues. And this is a new challenge for teachers, a new important challenge. You see, again, teachers are facing emerging challenges that they need to face together with teacher educators, together with researchers and with language policy makers. Following on that, one of the consequences is that it's quite important to start developing multilingual and multicultural education. This was highly stressed in Europe by, by the Council of Europe, by the, um, the new the uh, European Center for uh, um, Multilingual uh, Languages, multi, um, Multicultural Languages, uh, the ECML, because there is this need and some European institutions are trying to respond to that. But uh, what is uh, accepted is that we need multilingual and multicultural education across the curriculum. So for teachers, for teacher educators and researchers, this is quite important. And here I'm uh, mentioning uh, the language of schooling, something I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, to show you what uh, the Council of Europe has started doing, CLIL and EMI, English as a Medium of Instruction. So we need to develop new language policies. Some countries are already working on that in order to develop intercultural competencies. ITC literacy, because this is what our learners know better than us. And we need to learn it because we need to rely upon other sources beside the, uh, the course books. European exchanges were favorite, e-twinning projects. I don't know how much you know about e-twinning projects, but this was started uh, about 15 years ago in Europe. And it's an exchange of classrooms. And now they are started teacher training uh, initiatives in order to um, um, train and educate teachers also at university levels. And then Erasmus projects. Research. Now, why it's a challenge for research and researchers? Because we have noticed how relevant are the sociolinguistic studies, uh, for example, those that were carried out particularly in England on multicultural cities that show the emergence of hundreds and hundreds of different languages being daily used 
in a big city like London, for example. There is a study taking place in Rome at the moment and in other European capitals. And this is something that teachers should know about. Or lingua franca uses, I didn't use English as a lingua franca here. I use lingua franca uses, why? Because I think that in multilingual contexts, we are facing a big challenge, the challenge of emerging lingua francas. Uh, let me briefly open uh, parenthesis here. Together with a, 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 an assistant, a language assistant, um, uh, she is a PhD student uh, who uh, wrote her PhD in ELF in migration context, and she's an expert in mediation. I think Savio knows her, it's Silvia. Uh, we um, started a course for university students on field research. And we started observing in uh, uh, multilingual centers, centers for migrants that offer activities for both Italian young people and migrant young people uh, um, to observe what, how these activities take place and how these people interact. And the, the research field was uh, uh, how they used other languages to communicate. So what emerges there is not only English as a lingua franca, spoken by people who come from, uh, for example, from Syria or from uh, an African state uh, or from India, but also Italian as a lingua franca because they live in a country where they use Italian that has become a lingua franca for communication. That is a research area we should all be aware of because it's emerging. But also the importance of classroom-based research, something not all teacher education courses introduce, but that would be a very strong help, support for our teachers. This is what I wanted to show it to, uh, to you. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. This was, uh, uh, the language of school is, is an expression that comes from a very famous book by Mary Shepard Grell that came out in 2004, where she was investigated, investigating uh, the different languages spoken at school level. And it was then, uh, um, taken back by the Council of Europe and the, from the collaboration that Jean Cummins did with the experts of the Council of Europe. This uh, graph represents all the languages from schooling, uh, of schooling. Um, and uh, um, for example, uh, foreign languages, modern and classical, languages in other subjects, language as a subject and regional minority and migration languages. This is something, an, an ensemble of the language that, uh, of the learners uh, at school that we should always take into consideration in order to do what? To see what's in common, what are the threads in common and to reestablish um, re trends and uh, uh, revisit our teaching. Right. Uh, other emerging issues. Well, this is uh, the main topic. And by the way, we are in ILF Brazil, English as a lingua franca, which is the same acronym as Italiano lingua franca. So, We've got something in common, and uh, uh, but we are all very much concerned with what's happening to English, because English is on the move. English is changing. English is uh, something else. So we are have been observing the diffusion of word Englishes, new Englishes coming out 
or for example, multimedia that we had never expected to come out. And here I must say that the work of Alistair Pennicott was of big help to investigate what's happening in English within music or within uh, um, art and else English as a lingua franca. So we are observing that. And uh, obviously as language teachers, we are worried because it's something we can't control. So what are we going to do on that? So we started wondering about ELF in English language teaching, but not only in English language teaching, in any other foreign language teaching. That is, is French as a lingua franca being used? Is Italian as a lingua franca? So what comes out from research on ELF concerns all of us teachers and teachers of all languages, because this has implications for learners, teachers, and language policies. Threads, I see threads here. I spoke about threads at the beginning. The threads, the main threads, I, what I mentioned before is uh, uh, language education, but also translanguages, translingualism, as uh, Suresh Kanagaraja calls it, because translangu translanguages is a term that comes from Linwe and Ophelia Garcia. Translingualism comes from uh, Suresh, Karagaraja. CLIL, I already mentioned it, and the reasons why we should take it into consideration. And then also the implications and threads that are developing in the field of assessment and evaluation, and also in terms of language certifications. There are new trends now that are reconsidering the formats and the construct of language certification. <coughs> and then the issue of elf awareness. Elf awareness, and here I uh, borrowed uh, an expression that comes from one, one scholar that I was lucky enough to have as one of my trainers, that is Earl Stevick who used to talk about a way and ways to point at how many different ways there are to, uh, to be exposed to language and to learn language. Now, uh, something very brief on uh, definitions. We all know that English as a lingua franca is a multilingual means of communication. David Gradle, who unfortunately passed away two years ago, but he had written uh, a report, two reports actually on English, and he had written in 2006, English is no longer English as we have known, in, known it and have taught it in the past as a foreign language, but a new phenomenon now recognized as English as a lingua franca. So Gradle was mentioning that. But I would like to uh, quote uh, what can, came from what I call, I would call as uh, the royal family of elf, Jennifer Jenkins, Anna Maurannan, Barbara Seidelhofer, who speak about English as a shared language, English as an inherently multilingual means of English medium communication among people from different lingua cultural backgrounds. And as a, what we call a sine qua non for professional success and social inclusion. So I'm glad to be sharing this with you because even if we are already familiar with these definitions of health, it is important to bear them in mind because they, these definitions bring us or uh, 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 unveil new challenges, new challenges. Uh, right, I think I can, oh yes, there was something else that I wanted to conclude this page with, is the English classroom, which is, as Jennifer Jenkins defines it, an inherently multilingual contact zone. And it's, I think she clearly defined it. And this is where we all 
work. We all spend most of our day and produce materials. So, to conclude, uh, we have been facing in English as a lingua franca changes and shifts from, for example, the notion of correctness that we were accompanied by all through our lives thinking of standard English to the notion of appropriateness. Is this term appropriate? Or, uh, and we are not talking anymore about correctness. And the notion of intelligibility, which is sort of asking us to revisit with a lot of attention, for example, all the interactions, how we develop interaction, spoken interaction, and how we develop, for example, um, sk uh, listening skills, the audio or oral skills, which is something that has been sort of uh, um, um, overlooked, but is coming back again because the intelligibility is something we are not inserting in our teaching, this notion of intelligibility. Elf awareness here, I'm very quickly going through that because this comes from a colloquium uh, on elf awareness in ELT um, organized by Nico Sifakis at GELF in Helsinki in 2018. Uh, but this is uh, the notion of elf awareness has been put forward lately by Bayut and Sifakis, Sifakis and Said Hofer as a possible way of integrating the elf principles within ELT, which is one of the challenges that we've got. And as it was in, uh, in that, uh, uh, discussing that, in that colloquium, elf awareness urges anyone involved in ELT to critically engage with the growing elf research. And this is something which is new. This comes directly from elf. Very seldom teachers have been asked to engage with research on English language teaching. We were given summaries of research or justifications, rationales for introducing uh, new aspects in course books. Here with elf, we are bound to engage with the growing health research to better understand what's going on. And we as teachers and teachers educa teacher educators should be doing that. And uh, um, becoming health aware means becoming aware of the observations and principles that emerge from understanding how health works. For the first time, we are put into research as critical thinkers because we are asked to observe what's taking place in health and what research is showing us in order to reflect and undertake some changes in the language classroom. Uh, Elf were practitioners develop instructional sequences, lesson adaptations, policies, and tests that make sense of health while being relevant to and appropriate for each local teaching and learning context, its needs, its wants, and its idiosyncrasies. So this is an unexpected outcome of all the research on health, something that is engaging all teachers, all teachers, because they are asked to observe what's taking place in the language that is being mostly used all over the world, which is not the language they studied, we studied, and the language that is being uh, mostly used. What Elf Awareness attempts to achieve is to develop a framework of informing interested parties about Elf, but not imposing anything. This is quite important is raising awareness of what's taking place and starting thinking, what does this mean? Are the language functions changing because of that? Or maybe the language functions we normally use 
in our teaching classes, in course books, are not enough. They must be revisited. And uh, uh, so, not imposing any preset notions. And uh, uh, I am sort of moving directly to something else, something that I would like to share with you, something that comes from the research, uh, a research, a research project uh, um, from uh, uh, an Erasmus Plus uh, project. I think, I'm not sure whether Nikos Ifakis has already presented and uh, he must have referred, as I think Luis Guerra has referred to the uh, Enrich project. When we carried out the Enrich project, we based what we were doing upon a research on teachers and learners needs analysis that informed our courses. And I wanted to share with you something that relates to the adolescents in Italian schools. We investigated in Italy 136 adolescents aged 16 to 18, to whom we had asked, how did they have, uh, did they learn English? Where did they learn English from? And we offered them some, uh, some uh, possibilities, or some answers. And if you look at that, the majority there, look at uh, the majority, number 27, the ones who together agree and strongly agree, orange and yellow, they say that they learned English from listening to music. Interesting. How much do we use that? Do we use results of that research? We should be aware of that. Or for example, I have learned English from watching YouTube videos. 28% strongly agree, 42% agree. Or I, and this is quite important here, it's I have learned English from using social media, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, you see? how many of them or from online games, but fewer. I would have expected more, but they are fewer. Or look at, learn. I have learned English from watching movies and TV series. So I'm not showing you other results that in a way show that they uh, acknowledge the out of school experience as the best way to learn English. But this is something that tells us a lot. And if you look at what they agreed upon, like social media, YouTube, TV series, these are not standard English exposure. So our learners are already beyond what we are trying to do. And this is something that I think we should uh, reflect upon. These are the voices from the in English language Italian teachers, 107. What do they tell us about what they do in the classroom? Well, well, they say, for example, in number 21, in my teaching, I use authentic materials, TV series, films, songs, and the percentage is quite high. Unfortunately, students deny that because they say that they very seldom use authentic materials, but this is another matter. But it's interesting that they say they use that. And though, look at number 20. I teach standard British or American English pronunciation to my learners. You see how many, 89% agree and strongly agree. So what does this mean? That yes, they are aware of the existence of ELF, of the changes of English, but this is what they teach. They explicitly admit that they teach and they 
do not change because they, they are being taught to teach that, that standard pronunciation. Uh, it is also interesting uh, what they say in number 18. Uh, they say, I expose my learners to uses of English similar to those they may be exposed to outside the classroom. Uh, they, unfortunately, in the, in the analysis, we didn't ask for examples, but it would be quite interesting to learn more about that. What, what is the English they're exposed to outside the classroom? If I think of the Roman situation, the English are used outside the classroom. Well, maybe, uh, uh, as we said before, what the st students say, social media um, or uh, videos, TV series, uh, or even, even uh, films. But uh, if you walk around, even in my district, uh, uh, you will find lots of migrants who ask you things in English. They are just have just arrived and they speak English. So this is another type of English our learners are exposed to. So this is something that uh, I wanted to show you, to show you that we need to investigate what's taking place. We need to ask teachers what they are doing. We need to ask learners how they learn because that way, this is what we carried out as an health-based uh, research. This is telling us things that should start inform what we are doing every day. I wanted also, and this is, I'm going to the conclusion. I wanted to show you something that I did together with my colleagues with the Italian group of teachers who attended the Enrich Project Professional Development course. Why am I showing this to you? Because you might say, okay, this is the context, this is the situation, but excuse me, uh, how will teachers change their beliefs and their notions about their English language teaching practices. And we asked uh, um, our group of teachers to respond. I'm going to show you only one of these. Uh, have you modified your current beliefs and notions in your ELT practice? We were referring to the course that was a course uh, totally devoted to English as a lingua franca. And, uh, and we were asking them these questions related to part of the course. And we asked them, to re they could respond yes, no, or not yet, and why. Okay, we will show you, I will show you what they responded in the Padlet. I hope it, this works. No? Yes. Okay. It's coming, okay? Uh, the question was, have you added or modified your current beliefs and notions in your ELT practice? Yes, no, or not yet. Here there are, you can see some Italian names, Italian teachers, but also teachers from other countries because we had, for example, Saima Bedi, who is a Pakistani teacher who attended our course and also Kashif Raza, who is a Pakistan teacher teaching in Qatar. It is interesting to look at what some of these teachers responded, what uh, some of these teachers responded. Um, for example, let's look uh, uh, at what an Italian teacher said. She said, I knew about ELF, but it's been inspiring to reflect on its practical implications. I'm not sure I have modified my teaching. Still, I certainly have more resources to draw on. These days of forced lockdown and distant lessons will be a good way to put something into practice. You see, she responded to the question saying, I'm not sure yet because she was in the middle of the course, but we wanted to know whether uh, 
offering them a course with reflective practice was helping them. Let's look at what Simon Lucina, did. Sorry, uh, are we supposed to, to look at what you're reading? Because we, we are not, we just, uh, we are not, we're following what you're saying, the voices. Uh, I'm sorry, you're okay, okay, don't worry. Let's, let's see if I can uh, stop the share and open this again. I'm yeah, sorry. that would be good. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't think that I was good. Okay, no, here. No, it's probably because you opened another okay. screen. Yes, yes. yes. Can now, you yes. see now? Yes. All mm -hmm. right, okay. So I was saying that I wanted to show you what Saima Bedi from Pakistan said. I used to think that ELF is just like second language learning and the conversation is usually between native and second language learners. It focuses on use of good English, but she changed her mind. And uh, for example, um, Kashif Raza, uh, who says, can you see now? I hope so. I have been reading about ELF and multilingualism for a while. This course provides a better platform for understanding ELF and its role in ELT practices. I have started to see my students' language errors as variants and now focus more on meaning than structure and grammar. So this was something that I wanted to share with you to show you how, in a way, uh, beginning to work with English language teachers from different parts of the world, having a focus on what ELF unveils can trigger new reflections. They were at the second stage of the course, but they were beginning to focus upon that. Now, let me go back because I'm all um, running to the going to the conclusions, but I wanted to show you something else very quickly. And it's uh, uh, just a moment, okay? Okay. Hold on. No, I'm sorry. I got the wrong one. Now, can you see the next slide, Savio? Not, not yet, not yet. Okay, so I need to go and, uh, just a moment. Uh, okay, just a moment and I'll show mm -hmm, and I'll mm -hmm. share the screen. I'll okay. share the screen, just a moment. Yes. There are too many, too many things. Too many screens? Too many screens. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, let me know. Okay. okay. Some mm -hmm. implications for reshaping teaching and learning practices. Uh, Going back to what we did in the Enrich project, the needs analysis had highlighted that um, uh, there is an overall understanding and awareness of multilingual classes, new communicative needs, because most of the teachers who attended the course and attended my training course last year uh, are teachers who already work in multilingual and multicultural uh, classrooms, and they are aware that there is uh, the urgence of um, responding to new communicative needs uh, and uh, uh, that there are different instantiations of English and there is a new role for non-native speaker teachers. So they, they know that they need to prepare learners as successful communicators accepting forms of translanguaging in communication. They need authenticity to expose them to authenticity of input and of tasks. They need, they are aware of the relevance of out of school experience of information communication technology use and of social media. 
At the same time, we realize that, learn, that learners are quite aware of the learning processes, of their communicative competence, and of the most appropriate communicative and mediating strategies. And so the question comes, what is needed? Well, uh, this is a very sort of simple conclusion, but it's something that I think we would all agree upon. We need reflective teacher education, where, for example, where the English is an elf are embedded throughout the course components, and that learners out of school language experiences are valued in classroom life. This is quite important because if we don't activate this, if we don't use what comes out of research, and new courses as the one that the Enrich project developed, uh, we are bound to stick to very traditional way of teaching. Now, the growing diffusion of L needs to be taken into account by English language teachers and teacher educators in order to revisit language teaching and enhance language learning. I'm using here enhanced language learning because we tend to use uh, improve, but it's not improving. It's not in improving the key. The, uh, we have learners who are now the new protagonist. What does this imply? Now it's up to you who've been following me for the last, I think, 45 minutes, something like that. I hope I didn't go over time. Any questions? are, for example, would an health awareness approach be enough to sustain teachers in engaging in this enterprise in multilingual and multicultural context? What needs to be revisited according to you who've got different experiences, different backgrounds, different contexts? How, particularly, it's not only the what, but how do we want to revisit all of that? And what about, for example, Content teaching in English, clear. Mm -hmm. What about language outcomes? Uh, can we ensure language outcomes that respond to language policies in, in our country or across the world? What role for language education? What about multicultural competence? How much can we develop it? What is the function and role of assessment and evaluation where we are not using native speaker standards. What does this perspective unveil in language education? So here it's up to you. I've got something else about CLIL, but I won't show it now. I would like to hear your voices and maybe I can come out with some uh, um, some uh, results from a research I carried out on the use of an health component in, uh, uh, in a CLIL course. So I would like to invite you to intervene, thinking of their own context, because you are the only ones who know what happens in your context. You are the only one who knows your learners. So it's important to hear your voice and your personal views and beliefs about English language teaching. I would stop here uh, and I can now stop share. I'm here. There is more in terms of clean, but only for those who would like to know more about that experience. I think time, I've already gone out of time. So up to you. Sorry, Thank you, you take lead now. Thank you, Lucila. That's a, that's a wonderful presentation. We could be here listening to you for five hours because there's no, no, so no. much so much to say and so much to, you know. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I was thinking here that we are uh, currently offering a course here, an extension course on CLIL. And then uh, if we had another session for you to share your findings, and I know that you've been writing and researching CLIL uh, uh, in Italy and in Europe, that would be great. 
So, but thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Of course, it highlighted a lot of things that we've been reading and discussing. And of course, it's great because you localize, you know, the whole discussion with data from, from the Italian context that in many ways, uh, you know, we have similarities and differences. For example, you probably have a more multilingual uh, uh, context or multilingual classes than we do. But uh, I think the concerns and all the observations made by the teachers, for example, we get them here too. So uh, it's really, and of course it complements the text that you sent us. So then, yeah. uh, and, and for us to answer all those questions that you left Hi. at the end, it would take us, you know, a lot of time too. But anyway, I'm going to just uh, make a comment and then you can, you know, comment or not. And then I'll pass on to the people here. And also we'll see if we have questions from, from the, the YouTube channel. But thank you very much. It was really enlightening. If you could just share with us later, the, the slides would be course, wonderful. I will. I will. And congratulations on the Enrich project, uh, because uh, of course Nikos uh, and also our friends from Portugal, they have shared, you know, uh, different, uh, let's say, data from their context. But I think it's a wonderful project because it it brings information from different realities. Exactly. And, the, and what you brought was really, really very rich. But anyway, my question, of course, I had several things here to explore, but you mentioned uh, something that it called my attention when you said, of course, we need to enhance uh, the language instead of improving, because when we depart from improvement, it means that there is something wrong or something, let's say, faulty that needs to be corrected. And I really like that uh, association. Uh, and then uh, what, what, what do you think, for example, when the teachers, when you mentioned that, that the teachers seem to be very uh, alpha aware, so they have developed certain awareness, but even so, they still teach, you know, according to the tradition. So even the ones that, for example, uh, and, and also called my attention when you said we are beyond, you know, when the students, the data that you show that students, uh, uh, for example, they have a lot of English detached from this whole idea of bookish English that is standard oriented, et cetera, et cetera. And then they come to class and it seems that there is a clash between what they know that they took from music, from, uh, from series, from uh, you know, real life. And when it comes to the classroom, it seems that all this is disregarded right, by the teacher or at least part of it is disregarded by the teacher. So my question is how to evacuate these two situations, although the teacher seems to be aware, but even so uh, the teacher does it still or yet does not, uh, let's say, acknowledge or embrace this out of the classroom Englishes or English as a lingua franca that the student brings to class. That's my, my point. Well, uh, thank you for asking me that and for noticing. Uh, by the way, I didn't talk about noticing. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. There is a lot I, about I, noticing I will, here. I will bring it back. Okay. Uh, uh, the fact that I, I stress the importance of enhancing, because to me, enhancing means that they are already working on their own language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because they are not robots. Right. They, thinking, they use language continuously, they make comparisons. So we all we need to do is to enhance, provide them opportunities mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. bring reality back into the classroom. This is, I, I'm going to be a bit pessimistic here uh, only because I've been working as a teacher educator, as I told you, since 1982 officially. And the only times I could see a, what I would call a, um, a total engagement in uh, teachers attending courses were the times when the Ministry of Education <coughs> 
sort of valued teacher education courses, promoted teacher education courses, engaged teachers who were attending those courses in, for example, developing tests, language tests for the, all the exit levels. Teachers felt that they were part of the system. That happened only once with me involved and another time where I was involved in a teacher education course, but uh, how do you say it lasted this past matin. It was gone. It, the point is that there is not a serious, a serious uh, lack of perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, in the mm -hmm. last two weeks, uh, as usual, when it comes uh, September, the papers, TV shows are full of um, uh, articles, uh, people who are being interviewed about school. What can we do for the school? The school needs mm -hmm. improvement. How comes that education is the one that gets less money of all the other fields when there is an investment? Yeah. Let me tell you something that I, I strongly um, support this vision that we need more money, but it's not only a matter of money. No, yeah, you're it's right. Only, it's not only a matter of money. This can come and because it has to be, you always have to start from the bottom and then you are the country of Paulo Freire. And you, how many people are actually implementing that? You see, mm -hmm, there are mm -hmm. many more people in some countries in Europe uh, uh, using Paulo Freire's uh, ideas. I have the feeling that the only way to produce some change is through the school system, which is though a continuum. The point is our school system, if I, sometimes I tell my students, use uh, spend 13 years at school. You start when you are six and you finish when you are 19. And guess what? I counted how many hours of English you study. 1,350 hours of English. And when you mm -hmm. get to my university to get admitted, some of them are not even B1 level. You know what I mean? Is the community Yes, community. yes, absolutely. When mm -hmm. We ask for B1 plus at least, but the Ministry of Education says that they should come out with a B2. <laughs> Many students come out with a B2, but not because of the school system. It's because mm -hmm. uh, they Personal end up effort. School where there are exchanges, where they have these projects where foreigners come in. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, they are sent by rich parents abroad and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. But in the last few years, we know that it's also because they are autonomous. They mm -hmm. watch TV series in English. They mm -hmm. play games in English. So they, as, as we say, in spite of all, they, it's the famous Karen Johnson's in spite factor, no? Mm -hmm. They learn more. So I said, how comes that when they take the entry test, they are hardly... B1, and I drew a conclusion. We are using the wrong tests. We are not mm -hmm. asking them. We are measuring their knowledge according to our standards. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. not measuring the real knowledge. So we mm -hmm. should look for different ways of to, using to English assess. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. any other language, but it's particularly true with English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that we could, could be doing in the continuum of the 13 years. If there were more across the school system and the school levels uh, initiatives, we have some sort of collaboration between primary and middle school. No collaboration at all between middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. So it's separate compartments. And then you have the children who say, 
they always start again teaching us colors. When they, they come out with great experiences from primary school, and then they start middle school, which is, by the way, the weakest uh, link uh, in our school system. It needs to be. Mm -hmm. clean. So there is something that lacks within the school, and the school now are autonomous. So they should build on that. Mm -hmm. They are not totally dependent upon the Ministry of Education. So there is this possibility first. So more connections across schools, mm -hmm. more diffusion of research uh, results. And <coughs> unfortunately, more initiatives on the part of the Ministry of Education, not on giving money, but uh, investing money in effective points of, uh, of for enhancing, for example, all these communities of teachers mm -hmm, so that they mm -hmm. feel valued. If I know that the ministry doesn't give a damn, mm -hmm, that I'm mm -hmm. in a school where the principal is very good, my, my colleagues are very good, but next year we'll be moved to another school and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So I feel demotivated and I stick to my uh, notions, the ones that I learned when I was to my, my beliefs, right? To, be, to conclude, you can't achieve anything if you le you're left alone. Yes, yes. You can't. You can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there should be a network, and the network not only of language teachers, right? Of all teachers. I must confess that I was so happy when I started teaching the content teachers in the CLIL courses. Why? Because I felt an enthusiasm that English language teachers I have been teaching to have never had. They stopped thinking in a way because they sort of, how do you say, I can't think of the term, but they, like, they withdrew. While these teachers for the first time realized that They've never thought of the value of language for learning. Right, right. Never. never. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, they were thrilled by this. Mm -hmm. And there have been lots of research on that, in right. Europe at least, uh, mm -hmm. that showed mm -hmm. that. So never, you can't progress alone. No man is an island, and we need to work together. Networks. Mm -hmm. That's why I accepted enthusiastically <laughs> to connect with Brazil, because I'm sure we, we, we will hear similar things. Right, right. And share experiences. Mm -hmm. Look at results from research. And very important, this is something that I keep repeating, research has to go back to the people we research, to the, exactly. to the school, to the teachers. Right, right. Research is a privileged area. <clears throat> I once carried a, a presented a presentation at, at the Association of Language Testers, and I called this syndrome, researcher syndrome, as the title of a famous book. Maybe you heard about it. It was a book on punctuation that was published by an English writer, a journalist. It was called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. And they were talking about pandas, okay? Mm -hmm. And, but it was written without commas. Mm -hmm. Eats, shoots, bamboo shoots, and leaves, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the point was, punctuation. But the real point was that I used that is that it represented so well. All these scholars who go into the classroom, they eat the data, they shoot pictures, never asking for uh, permission. Now, because uh, academic journals ask for permission, but before nobody asked for permission. Right, and, right. Uh, they leave and they never take back what I carried out my research on young learners, the Ellie project for five years in Italy. 
we were seven countries. Very important research. I, um, I monitored and followed for five years uh, 180 children from primary school one to primary school five mm -hmm. for five years. So I saw them growing, okay? When we presented the results in Warsaw, and there were seven European countries, I asked the Ministry of Education to send a representative. Nobody was sent. Only mm -hmm. the principal of the school, one of the schools that I was observing came. Research results should be given back. Yes, because you I have totally to agree. Ask, you have to question. Why do you say that? Or why did you do that? Nobody does that. I had mm -hmm. a discussion with a colleague the other day. She said, well, because um, we were asking for signatures of um, permission signatures from uh, migrants who take a certification in Italian as a second language. And I said, beware, because they will sign whatever. This is not ethical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, but we are doing this to improve the certification. This doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You're right. You're right. But I don't know if I told you, but certainly. Look, yes, yes, yes. We have the same, the same thing here, Lucila. Well, this is great, but I need we need to go on because That's there are great. several questions for you. Okay. And uh, and and uh, let's start. That thank you very much for this reflection. So let's begin here. Gabriela has a question for you, and then we're gonna take questions from the the YouTube. YouTube. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Thank Good you for morning, your presentation. Gabriela. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and my question is about um, language policies and curriculum. And because here in Brazil, since 2017, we have a national a national core curriculum. And I would like to and this curriculum adopts the perspective of English as a lingua franca. Good. And yes, into the English discipline. And I would like to know if there is such a thing as a national curriculum in Italy. And if there is, uh, what is the perspective, the language per perspective that it adopts from, uh, for English teaching? And if you think that because of these changes in these uh, official documents, right? Uh, if you think that it can bring effective changes in the, in the language classroom. Thank you for the question. And uh, um, I would say that since, uh, well, the uh, Ministry of Education documents that were produced in the last 30 years, some of them are quite interesting. I mean, uh, I was mentioning before the interest of language education or better say educational linguistics one of our ministers of education was a very famous linguist, Tullio de Mauro, who wrote the 10 theses for uh, educational linguistics. And uh, uh, so there was an interest. And, uh, uh, but I want to answer immediately to your question. We haven't got what we would call a national curriculum. We have national guidelines. Indicazioni nazionali, we call them, for each level, primary, middle, and high school, with a distinction because in high school you've got vocational schools and you've got classical lycée, linguistic lycée, um, humanistic lycée, so with different organization and different distribution of foreign languages. In the linguistic lycée, they study three foreign languages. Uh, Officially at middle school, they should take a second language, which is usually either French or Spanish, because we've got a policy of the policy. It was imposed, English only. So these poor children, not only from primary, but from kindergarten, they start being exposed to English. Now, can you imagine? It enters here and it goes out here. And when they come to middle school, they say they're teaching me colors again, because there is no action on building up continuity. So we've got national guidelines, the Indicazioni Nazionali, that have come in uh, 
uh, between 2008, 10, 12, and the last ones, I think it was 16. In principles, they are excellent guidelines because they are in terms of language education. Most of the principles are quite clear and they are across the curriculum. That is, there is a general overlook and plus um, foreign languages are addressed in the same way. The point is how much these are being implemented and how much there is control on that. Because that's the other point. There is no control. Because if I tell my students, I'm going to take you from B1 to B2 in a year, I have to prove that. There will be exams that will prove that. And if I don't, uh, point is that nobody is going to punish me or ask me, how comes? I'm not talking about punishment. I'm talking about uh, the idea that our work should be monitored, internally monitored by the school, for example, and offer ways of sustaining people if they get bad results, in order to understand, carry out action research in the classroom and so on and so forth. So Gabriela, we haven't got what you've got, but we've got something which is quite interesting. And I wonder, but I wonder how many teachers actually use them as a reference point because they are there and there is no obligation. Yes, there is an introductory year, not to talk about all the policies on teacher education pre-service. Let's forget about that because it was a total disaster in the last few years. But again, I'm not asking for control. I'm asking for scaffolding. Because otherwise, teachers, they don't do it on purpose. Because you don't do ask only for bad results. You have to ask the reasons for good results as well and have these teachers share the reasons for good results. Because uh, I have to move my, uh, my uh, computer, sorry, because they say that the, the connection is not so strong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, it, it sort of froze for a couple of seconds, but we're back. So I'm moving it towards my uh, modem, okay? Okay, good, good. Okay, so I'm saying that I think to answer also what Savio was in a way asking, uh, I think that there should be a different understanding of what education is like. Some schools do it. Some schools are excellent because we've got excellent principles in spite of all, in spite of all. We've got excellent teachers at all levels, at all school levels, but, but, I doubt it very much that teachers sort of use those guidelines to discuss, for example, ways of improving what they're doing or adjusting, for example, to health, to new English, if, if we're talking about English, okay? But we're talking also of changes, for example, now, in many schools in Italy, they introduced, uh, uh, even from, from middle school, Chinese and Arabic. There is a lot of requests for Russian. So the types of foreign languages, the, uh, the foreign languages are becoming more and more. And obviously parents understand that this is valuable, but there are no cross language preparation. We had a wonderful program that was started in 1989. It was a pre-service program called SIS, S-S-I-S, a two-year program where teachers were prepared for that, for teaching with 
a lot of, uh, um, of activities. And I remember at that time, they asked me to suggest the name of someone who could uh, educate the supervisors of these teachers. And guess who came, Savio? Donald Freeman. Ah, okay, Donald Freeman. They still mm -hmm. remember him. Yes, After of that, course. The, the whole these courses were excellent, but in the end, to them, it's much better what we call the philosophy of sitting with Nelly. You go into the classroom direct and you learn. There will be a tutor there, a, an older teacher, which works. It's excellent as an idea, but together with a scaffolding again. I don't know, Gabriela, if I answer, but I want to answer to tell you something else about the curriculum uh, and the language policies. And also here we are entering language planning in uh, um, um, Jolo Bianco's terms, uh, because language planning has a lot to do with us, right? When in 1985, the primary school in Italy was reform, underwent a reform, and they introduced a foreign language, the a foreign language study from beginning from the third year, from eight years old, okay? There was no mention of which language, because they said the main aim is to provide learners with a new tool for organizing their learning and thoughts, their thoughts and learning. So it was not important which language. What was important is that they were engaged like they are engaged in artistic education, art education or musical education in something that makes them think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It lasted again, let's pass down my 10. English only from first year and now from primary uh, from pre from pre primary where by the way yeah. at kindergarten level we've got lots of activities carried out uh, what they call le o lang no uh, language awakening experiences carried out not just by um, kindergarten teachers but also by pa parents. And we've got lots of wonderful activities uh, of, from Chinese families, Indian families, Pakistani mm -hmm. families, and uh, migrant families who come and expose the rest of the, the group to their language. That's been canceled. Now we're going to have English on the F3 prime. Yeah, this is very sad, isn't it? It's very sad. When I talk about scaffolding, I yeah, yeah. provide all these opportunities. But I'm talking too much. I know, I'm sorry. OK, great, great. So uh, now, uh, thank you, Gabriela, for your question. Now let's, uh, Luciela, can you jump in and, and see the questions from the, from the, or Daniel, from the channel? Yes, 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 yes. It's Daniel who is going to do it. He's all prepared for today. Okay, yeah, good, yeah. good. Uh, Lucilla, we have lots of questions made, oh from, made, made in YouTube. Um, our friend uh, Ana Paula Duboc said, thank you, Lucilla. Thank you, dear Savio and colleagues from UFBA for organizing such great talks. And her question is very similar to Gabriela, so I guess you've already answered. She, she asks, what is the current status of ELF in Italian educational policies. So I guess you've already answered that. Let's, well, partly, uh, partly because I, would yes. You like to, would you like to add something, please? Yes, I would like to add, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, that I managed to have uh, ELF and word English is introduced uh, as one of the main themes uh, that future teachers of English should know about. It's a little, uh, a little, stone that was introduced, but uh, there is much more diffusion than we think, and it's happening because there are many health researchers in different Italian universities. Okay. okay. Great. Uh, we have a question from our friend, uh, Itana Lins. Uh, 
What about correctness and appropriateness, which have been or is about to be substituted for intelligibility? What do you think about the validity and uh, rela reliability of international exams? Okay, uh, I think, yes, uh, you're right, because this is a question that many teachers ask. They say, okay, but then in the end, do I need to correct or do I need to ignore? I don't think it's these two ways. I think that exposing learners in, uh, in the classroom to different types of Englishes and pushing towards a, a, the enhancement of their own capabilities as communicators, effective communicators, uh, is uh, a, something that should be valued. In terms of uh, final exams, uh, it mm -hmm. depends very much. You have, as usual, uh, to work from the bottom in order to introduce slightly uh, some criteria that might take into consideration also some variability and uh, also uh, the notion of correctness should be revisited. It's not that correctness needs to be refused. This is not what we are saying and every researchers are saying. Correctness is there, but maybe what do we include in the notion of correctness? And when this comes to intelligibility. If you don't um, help learners, first of all, to understand that they need to be intelligible, in order to communicate, it is very difficult then to get out of the notion of correctness. But intelligibility is something that goes together, as I said before, also with appropriateness. What is appropriate to be said? And let me tell you something, that there is very little work done still now in terms of uh, appropriateness, which is always limited to formality and informality. Appropriateness is only linked to that. But appropriateness is uh, to understand someone who is speaking to you. And let's put it this way, who is a native speaker, but uses uh, appropriate terms that maybe are part of a slang, for example. And uh, in an interview, they might come out with expressions that are part of his line. So uh, in that interview, it's appropriate. So uh, these are notions. I'm not saying that you have to accept that. No, but you have to develop and scaffold this awareness. This has to be done. This needs to be done. In terms of certification, as far as I know, there, has been, uh, a, a, um, there have been several research studies on trying to sort of modify and welcome different types of performances from people who um, uh, take a certification. I know there is a lot of work that has been uh, carried out, research work carried out by people like Tim McNamara, for example, or even, um, uh, it escapes the name now, but it will come later. Anyway, and I have a very close friend with whom I carried out a, a project, a research project. His name is David Newbold. David has been writing extensively on how to rethink the notion of uh, certification within such a, because we are moving in a movable scenario where people who will give us jobs are non-native speakers and who may be, they are appropriate, but not correct. So, so Sheila, is David Newbold, you mean, you, you said? Yes, David Newbold. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. David Newbold, he works at the University of Venice uh, and uh, he's been writing. If you want, I can send you something. And, uh, but I, the other name that comes with Tim McNamara, well, one for all, Ileana Shoami, 
but there is someone else uh, whose name I can't recall right now, but okay. several people. Who Let us know when you remember. Thank yes. you. Okay. I will write it down. Okay. Yes, okay, Daniel, have, next. We have a question from uh, Poliana, our friend Poliana. Uh, she says, hi, Lucila, I participated in an Enrich course, and I remember your contribution to the sections on methods and approaches uh, was really relevant. I would like to thank you for that. Uh, and she continues, she, she asks, could you please tell us why is Clio a useful method for an AlphaWare perspective in ELT? Okay, let me say that. Thank you very much, Juliana, uh, uh, her name? Liana, okay. yes. Um, Thank you very much for asking this question. I'm not saying that CLIL is a perfect methodology. By the way, there is a lot of discussion. Is it a methodology? Is it an approach? CLIL is CLIL. And to me, CLIL is closely related to Italian teachers of chemi chemistry, of history, of uh, maths, uh, of Italian of uh, whatever subject who uh, have a, enough competence in English to teach their subject, not all of it, uh, in the, only in the last few years in, in another language, in English in this case. Why do I need, do I associate English and CLIL, uh, English as a lingua franca and CLIL? because I notice the readiness to understand the notion of elf, of a language that is spoken by non-native speakers in order to communicate, the readiness was much more on the part of content teachers than on the part of English language teachers. So, their disposition was different. And I think that I, in the article I sent you, I, I mentioned some, uh, some of, the, of their quotes saying, for example, uh, watching films and soap operas with my learners, I realized I had never understood how spoken language works. This is a, an English teacher, though. Non importa se non è standard. It doesn't matter if it's not standard. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, or uh, questions about, uh, um, I now see so many different ways of saying things in English. It is so rich. Now, this is what struck me about English teachers. They have their own path they would accept to add something else, like English as a lingua franca or word Englishes. But the frame of mind often is the same. And I understand that because they need to be sustained, as yeah. uh, I was telling Savio, they need to be scaffolded. But then, Lucila, just uh, uh... Don't you think this is because it takes them, when we introduce something like this, it takes them from the comfort zone of uh, standard of everything? Exactly. You control. You are in control because you are yeah. the one who knows. That's exactly. Interesting. That's interesting. And this is why, to respond to Poliana, the question, uh, CLIL was useful for me to understand how these teachers of different subject matters, which makes them different from a group of English language teachers only. Because, well, they, they, I had in a group something like 24 different subject matters with their own reasoning, their own background. So they mm -hmm. had to adjust. They had to adjust. And that way they started seeing that it's more than meets the eye what I was trying to say before. And I don't know if I will answer other questions, but I, if, if we still got five minutes later, I will show what I had loaded in terms of CLIL, okay? Okay, well, 
Daniel, you decide. If, if maybe you can take one more question and, and then uh, Lucilla can, can show us. So hope people can stay a little longer because it, this is so interesting. It's Friday. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the last, the last question. It's from our friend too, Arnon. Arnon says, thank you very much, Lucilla, for a brilliant lecture on such a relevant topic to make our English teaching perspectives more updated. And he asks, uh, can we categorize ELF by country uh, facilitates a more general acceptance of ELF or try to find a way to harmonize the different styles of ELF? Uh, I, it should be better. There is a, a typo here, I can understand. But did you get the, the question? I think that I got that um, I, I didn't get the name. Ah, no. Ah, no. Arno. Okay. Arno. Arno. Okay. Um, yes, I think I understand that. Uh, this is something that, if if I understood it correctly, this is something that I think of very often. The elf we refer to in each country is a different elf, inevitably, unavoidably. Sometimes when I use uh, the voice a corpus or look at uh, uh, the alpha corpus, I realize that uh, maybe we should start building up an Italian corpus of elf. This would be very interesting. And uh, uh, because, <coughs> because for its very nature, it has different, um, different repertoires, different understanding, different forms. And this, again, makes us maybe a bit unstable. So we draw conclusions from reading the voice or reading uh, the alpha or reading uh, the Asian corpus. And as a matter of fact, uh, for example, when we talk about the English language, uh, English as lingua franca core, yes, there are some things that constitute the core. But what is fascinating is that ELF is developing differently according to the speakers. And the, that's why we need to work a lot in class on observing language, working through language because uh, this is the only way to, not to be in control, but to start seeing things. And for example, analyzing a transcription as my students will be doing, the students who are now visiting this migration center, one of them asked me, uh, yes, but you are asking us to observe things when we don't know anything about the mother tongues of all these migrants. We don't know the language typologies, okay? And I said, but this is not what I'm asking you to do. This, what you're talking about, knowing about the language typologies means that you are developing as a linguist. And uh, this is not what we're doing. What I'm asking you to do is to observe how much they're used of English or the use of Italian deviates from uh, what we normally listen to in, uh, uh, in a context with all Italian speakers or with all English speakers. So I don't know if I answer the question, but I acknowledge the fact that there are different elves to me, but maybe the, the royal family might come out differently. But it's, this is my opinion. It's an enrichment and a, a way of enriching our experience. Other okay, questions? so now, Lucilla, yeah, you can. Uh, you said you want you wanted to share a little bit of the Clio. Uh, if I manage, you know, if I manage, please, because Let after me. this, it's twelve now here and must be what five o'clock there. <laughs> and tea time for me. Yes, that's right. I but anyway, okay, go ahead. Just a moment, just a moment, yeah. because I mm -hmm. need to go through. Okay, let me see if now I can 
share the screen. Yes, it is here. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, this is a very long presentation that I did uh, uh, four years ago at AAAL, and mm -hmm. it was uh, Elf and Clil. I can't remember the exact title. Uh, Elf in and through Clil. Well, uh, you see, you recognize the left hand side, the language of school is something that I use a lot. What I think it would be important for you to look at is what Mohan said, which is, I mean, I think constitutes uh, the background of what we were discussing. Uh, it's a paradox and the limits of Quill. Language is a system which relates what is being talked about content and the means used to talk about it, expression. Linguistic content is inseparable from linguistic expression. In subject matter learning, we overlook the role of language as a medium of learning. And in language learning, we overlook the fact that content is being communicated. To me, this is quite a relevant statement because we tend to overlook these things. That's why we need to be, become good observers, okay? Now, let me show you something else if I manage. Very difficult to manage with trying to, okay. Uh, language and languaging in content learning. I said that I had forgotten to talk about noticing. Noticing, which go goes back to Schmidt's idea of yeah. noticing, is something mm -hmm. that uh, has been reconceptualized and revisited. And uh, now we tend to use uh, um, um, what's her name? Uh, it will come again. I'm too tired. Is the idea uh -huh. of languaging okay? Uh, mm -hmm. the idea of languaging, or as many people have started saying, something that I remember using a long time ago, but I now I'm glad to see that people are more and more using that. It's Englishing, yeah. So we are observing, uh, so uh. I think that in this presentation, I, uh, I said that clear teacher used noticing and language in tasks during the training with a foreign language and the subject specialist tutor. And some of these tasks were used, also used by clear teachers later on within the local school language practice when they revisited their content through language and collaborated with their students and with foreign language colleagues. Let me tell you something I noticed. Clear teachers, that is subject teachers using a foreign language, tend to rely much more on their students because their students are very supportive of them. Mm -hmm, Most of mm -hmm. these students may have the same level of English or even higher, and they are very collaborative. So I see that as a community of practice. Uh, well, I am going to go through this very quickly. You know, I'm going to skip this. Uh, here is the communities of practice I want to tell you about. Teachers of different subject matters learn to collaborate together and explore implications of using another language to widen the borders of their subject matter. This is what English language teachers often don't do. They don't widen the borders of their subject matter. So it is something that I notice in clear courses, something I, it hadn't occurred to me at all. Foreign language teachers are challenged by the demands of revisiting their own approach to foreign language teaching. So it is important collaboration among subject spe specialists because they, these unveil similarities among subject matters as well as the central role of language, whether it is L1 or L2 and subject specific literacies in sustaining effective comprehension, learning, and teaching. Subject teachers, as well as their students, are gradually co-constructing a new type of classroom discourse. And it's in English, something mm -hmm. that English teachers haven't still yet built. That's why I consider not CLIL as uh, 
good for health. But I noticed that in CLIL, health awareness is easier and it uh, leads to more, um, to more uh, uh, development in terms of uh, teacher development. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is what I did, uh, that I embedded an alpha aware approach in the CLIL courses. Uh, I will skip that and um, <coughs> I introduced this new perspective on the notions and ideas about English, its variations and its emerging instantiations. But I will skip that because I want to go to elf in and through CLIL. Which are the implications? Adopting a plurality perspective, awareness of the complexity and plurality of English, a starting point for a less Anglophone centered materials. It provides the opportunity to engage teachers in language awareness, while English language teacher learners are become, become independent intercultural and cross language explorers and users in a variety of English using context. And uh, if what is important to use English's and ELF available resources, usage based and language, here I wrote it, or English in tasks. Um, sorry, the name of the person who introduced languaging. Originally it was Robert Lado, but it was, um, uh, the woman, uh, Mary, Mary Swain, sorry mm -hmm. about that. Okay, so this, we have to, we need a shift in devising tasks and activities because teachers and these may resort to a variety of multimodal resources, exposing learners to multilingual context, videos, international content lessons with activities that engage learners in comprehending non-native speakers using English in authentic exchange context. This should become part of the test because if they are able to understand that, they would be able to understand native speakers as well. And involve learners in noticing similarities and differences in L1 and L2 in idiomatic uses, in sounds, in different forms of politeness and encourage out of school experiences through a process of active mediation with an appropriation of English. And this, now this is part of my research that I carried out with the CLIL. And uh, uh, this is interesting. This I always show this, it comes from a course I run for CLIL teachers at least eight years ago. I leave it to you. Can you read it? It's, you want uh, you want me to read or just silently? No, no, uh, no, no. I no, I'm reading it. It comes from Jacob, my science teacher, to show you the enthusiasm these clear teachers have got, uh -huh, contrary uh -huh. to English teachers. I think that is really a thrilling experience. It takes you completely out of your comfort area, that right. lukewarm, calm, relaxing, and a little boring routine in which you dive every day with no worries. It may seem strange, but one fine day you decide to break free. So all that seems to be clearly fixed is again brought into play. You have to prepare the lessons very carefully, look for the right words, learn different ways of assessment, jot down a good sequence of topics and all additional new and hard work. So I feel very satisfied with that data and it really shows, as my students say, while teasing me a little, when I'm teaching clear sciences, I speak louder, I can't stand still, I wave my arms. That's all true, I reply. You know why? I'm so thrilled. And I think I can finish with that or showing at the end with something that comes from students. Why can't we apply this system also to other subjects? Okay, that's it. I think I'm finishing here. Okay. Lutila, and I think I think we are going to invite you to for another session on CLIL and ELF because okay. this was this is really this is really interesting this is yeah. really interesting it's cross uh, section yeah anyway cross. but thank you thank you very much so it was really as as i expected and predicted it was really great to hear you and, and you know to and there were no this, challenging questions huh eh? Ah, uh -huh. so you see, you were very nice. 
But anyway, uh, I'm sure that uh, everybody, after these two hours that just flew by, you know, we are, uh, it was really, really nice and interesting and enlightening and enriching. So uh, again, again and again, thank you very much for, for, for this wonderful uh, morning, afternoon with the, uh, you know, with us. And uh, uh, so now we are going to stop uh, the, the live stream. And then I'd like to thank everybody for, Lucila, don't leave immediately, please. No. So I'd like to thank again Lucila for being with us and uh, especially the, the, you know, uh, the group, the, the researchers that were here with us. And thank you very much, the people that joined us in, uh, on the channel. So we'll see you next, uh, uh, our next guest on October the 2nd, if I'm not mistaken, uh, will be Michelle Alcadri from Londrina, and then on the 6th, the 16th of October, we're going to have Lili Cavallero from, oh. from Lisbon. So, but thank you very much, everybody, and see you in two weeks. Lucila, thanks again. Thank you, Sam. Grazie mille for this wonderful moment. Prego, prego. But shall I be able to see the YouTube video? Yes, you're going oh, to see yeah. everything. Everything will be there for you to see in a minute. So you oh, can see the whole, the chat. You can see the chat, the to questions. The, go on to the hairdresser. It's, it's <laughs> going to be there forever now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Daniel, have you stopped? Not yet. Okay. Bye-bye. So, okay, goodbye, so, everybody. And thank you. I Lucilla, must come we, back we, to eat. How do you call it? I 